What ails our democratic institutions? It's a vital question that can't be asked too often and that the Samara Center for Democracy takes seriously in its latest round of exit interviews with outgoing members of parliament. This installment is titled Flip the Script, Reclaiming the Legislature to Reinvigorate Representative Democracy, and we're pleased to welcome some of those who've lived the life and can contribute to that conversation. Paul Zabo was the Liberal MP for Mississauga South from 1993 to 2011. Joe Preston was the Conservative MP for Elgin, Middlesex, London from 2004 to 2015. Mylène Freeman held Argenté, Papineau, Mirabel for the NDP from 2011 to 2015. And we're also pleased to welcome Jane Hilderman. She's Executive Director of the Samara Center for Democracy, parliamentarians and not. We welcome one and all uh, to our little table here at TVO tonight. And let's just set this up with um, just sort of a bit of a highlight pack, Jane, from your report. So, Sheldon, let's bring up this graphic. Uh, at Samara, they did 54 MP exit interviews in total, representing MPs from across the country. And in doing so, they accumulated more than 100 hours of recorded tape. It's the second time they've done it. 25 were former New Democrat members, 23 Conservatives, 3 Liberals, 3 Green Independent, Force Démocratie, etc., etc. 23 female, 31 male. Add it all up, 400 plus years of total parliamentary experience among those interviewed. And Jane, you begin re your report with the ominous words, representative democracy is in trouble. How come? Well, when we spoke to MPs, we wanted to understand um, how they found their job uh, mm -hmm. on the Hill in particular. We also asked them about their work in the constituency. That's going to be a subject of a later report. But when it comes to the work on the Hill, which I think they are uniquely positioned, that's the main job that they have, <laughs> um, we heard that their role as representative faced a lot of challenges. And we'd heard this before, but what had changed since we spoke to the last round and this round was sort of an intent and growing intensity of partisanship um, that their kind of scriptedness, a sense of uh, di greater party discipline was starting to spread kind of beyond what we had heard in the past um, to other areas of parliament where there had in the past been more independent work, uh, more cross party collaboration like in committee. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that you know, if we are sending our representatives to Ottawa and they can't speak up on behalf of cons their constituents or can't have a somewhat independent mind, um, that the fu fundamental premise of our democracy is uh, slowly being undermined. Has negative consequences for our democracy. All right, well, let's go around the table and find out. Paul, you have said, I guess you're the longest serving here, so we should start with you. Uh, you've said that MPs in the House are divided into two distinct classes. What are those classes? Well, those with some experience and those who are just there for the first time uh, is, is really part of the problem because there is no orientation, uh, significant or relevant orientation of new members of parliament. They're left to their own uh, and the party will let them sit in some seat and uh, basically let them uh, stick handle their way through the process. Uh, we need, we have a big problem. Parliament is not orienting new members of parliament, it would help enormously. Now, we just had an election in the province of Ontario, and we had some of the rookie MPs, uh, MPPs, excuse me here, last week, and they all said they got a day where they all went into the chamber and somebody took them through the do's and don'ts and, you know, how to mind your P's and Q's and all that. Okay. You didn't get that okay. on Parliament Hill? But, but first of all, you know, to have a day, well, you, you realize that there is another 100 different people here and they all have questions. You can't cover a lot of things and you can't anticipate. Uh, one of the things that does happen though is people let you know how little they know and you have to, you have to address it and it can't be addressed in a, an hour, a day. It takes a year at least before they can touch all the bases and understand how relevant and important those are to them and their riding. Joe, that's interesting because the assumption is that once you get elected, you must know politics, otherwise you wouldn't have got elected. Sure. Why did you try to get the job? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, when you got in there in 2004 for the first time as an opposition conservative MP, how right. much did you or didn't you know about what the actual job entailed? I, I, I agree with Paul. I knew, I knew almost nothing about what the workings of the job were. I knew what the results of the job were. That we went there to make legislation. We went there, in, in that case, in opposition to, to hold the government to account. How to do that was never explained um, until we kind of learned it. I, 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 we're, we're talking. I, I, 
I, I took it on myself to help with the orientation of new parliamentarians over the next three elections because I did not know what I was getting into when I got there. I'm guessing it was even worse for you because you were part of that orange crush that came in of the NDP in Quebec, okay. most of whom, let's be honest here, had no expectation that they were going to win, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people didn't know what they were getting themselves into. And, and uh, that year, too, there were a lot of new Conservatives. 2011 was, I think, one of the biggest incoming, I mean, <laughs> since 2015. I think 2015 was the only yeah. bigger one. Um, and they had set up a sort of, you know, quick sort of um, orientation with everyone and then, you know, sort of break it down with, you know, the different uh, offices, finance, and like how does your budget work and things like that. But I, you know, I didn't retain any of that information that first day because, you know, it was you're coming right off an election, you've got all these things, you've got all these plans. Well, in fairness, how old were you when you got elected? I was 22, so I was very young you were... <laughs> and, and it was also learning how to manage an office, right? Mm -hmm. Like that for me was a big learning curve that I, that really took exactly. me several years to feel like I, I knew what I was doing. Um, and I think, you know, that's not limited to just being uh, a young person. I think that really is. There are a lot of people that come in there and they've never managed five people before and, and were, you know, a $300,000 budget. And you and were expected to do ultimately that. Ultimately, that's what you're doing. Um, and it's also about knowing what are the different tools in your toolbox, depending on the political context, depending on what's going on. Um, and that information I really got from mentors and talking to MPs who had been around for a while and people who like to do things differently. And that's where I got a, a lot of my ideas from. Sheldon, let's bring this up. Here's a quote from the report that will uh, propel our discussion along here. Leaders have grown in strength and capacity relative to the party caucus. Unelected staffers to the leader, the boys and girls in short pants, carefully manage the party brand. Any dissent from party leadership is rare, inconsequential, and swiftly punished. Step out of line, even on an ostensibly free vote, and your name's now on somebody's hit list, explained one former MP. Uh, okay, Paul, how often were you told, don't you dare say this, or please, you must say this, that kind of thing. First of all, I was elected by a party and a platform that they represented to the people of Canada. I was there representing that and supporting it. So that when matters like this came up, I was never uh, somehow directed or intimidated to do something. It is obviously what you were elected to do. So I, I think it's maybe an overstatement in the majority of cases. People who are, have been there before and are a little disenchanted may be the ones who are the disruptors or who, who, who complain. They're not afraid of complaining because they have basically uh, alienated themselves from the, from the leadership. You don't get touched, I don't think, you don't get touched by the party uh, employees mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing your job. The assumption, or certainly the conventional wisdom, Joe, was that the Stephen Harper-led Conservatives brought that kind of crack-the-whip partisanship to new, unforeseen levels. Was that your experience as well? Well, I, I think during minority situations, it was probably ev a bit more strict. But it was based, as Paul said, on, on you're wearing a team uniform. You, you did run on, on, on issues. You were expected to vote properly on the issues that were part of platform. The largest discussions that would occur at caucus, where group would decide which way we're going, would be on, gov uh, gov in those days, we're opposition, on government legislation that hadn't been covered during the election, wasn't platform. Of course, we'd have different views from, from you know, good old, uh, good old boys from Alberta and, mm -hmm. and, and, and new conservatives from, from southern Ontario. Mm -hmm. and, and we would express our views and, and decide as a group, as a team, how we would vote. I think that's natural within all, all the caucuses. But as Paul said, there wasn't too many of those things. This was, you know, we ran on a, on a set platform of what we were going to be as conservatives, and in our case, in, in minority to begin with, and then uh, three terms in government. It, it, it was expected. Okay. You're right. These two sat on the government benches. You never did. So this might be a bit different for you. Were you ever scolded or told, you know, we, we really don't want to hear you say that anymore? <laughs> So that never happened to me. I would say with for us, what happened, um, it was more an atmosphere of not wanting to make any mistakes um, and wanting to make sure that the that the message was coherent. When we got there, the NDP, you know, taking uh, official opposition for the first time, there was a lot of scrutiny. Um, and um, we certainly wanted to look like we knew what we were doing. And we went out of our way to make sure that that was the case, especially with 
um, Stephen Harper's government, who had been there for a while, you know, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to, they had, they, or they certainly presented as running quite a tight ship. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we were trying to do as well. So there was sort of that pressure that was there. And I think that that did manifest for some people in, in you know, being told not to do certain things or to do certain mm -hmm. things. Um, and, and I think that was what was going on there. It was trying to like, to, to really be able to present that sort of coherence. Mm -hmm. Jane, let me get you to weigh in, in as much as, you know, the conventional wisdom that people hear is, they're all a bunch of train seals there, they're whacked on the wrist anytime they do anything wrong. Although here we hear, you know, a couple of stories of people saying, look, we ran us on this party with this platform, you would expect us to support it. Is there a balance that has somehow not yet been found between the need for party discipline on the one hand, and on the other hand, representing constituents' views, trying to express a little independence from time to time, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that it's about a balance, mm -hmm. and certainly the MPs we spoke to, I don't think that they were all truly rebels in the sense that they <laughs> believed that they had run for a party platform, too. Uh, but they were looking for, like as, as Joe said, not everything is on the party platform mm -hmm. that comes up for discussion. Sure. Yeah. And there are occurrences that arise where you think maybe someone across the aisle has a good idea, and right. you think, I want to support that mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. And it can be hard in Parliament uh, for that optics to happen sometimes, is what we've mm. heard. Um, or uh, parties just would preventative, take a preventive measure and pull someone off committee that they thought was going to uphold an amendment from an opposition member. This oh, happens, it happens today too mm. in Parliament. Yeah, if I can. All the parties have caucus meetings at the, the regional and the national level, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And these, this is where this comes up. It actually comes up. Somebody says, you know, I like that idea. Is there something that we can do or we can add to it or we can make it beneficial? Because we're not here to just say, let's be against everything of the opposition parties. Really, Great. some of the best stuff that has happened didn't come from a government. But that's what I want to know, Joe. We, uh, again, the assumption is you are told to oppose come hell or high water. It doesn't matter how good the idea may be on the government benches. Was that your experience? No. No, I mean, as I said, if it was our, our idea, why would we oppose it? Mm -hmm. If it was an idea from another party, we are, had already likely stated our position as to where we were on it. Um, there was some great procedural stuff that, that, that caused the best discussion, uh, whether it was Michael Chong's changes, some of the That's, stuff you did, Paul, yeah. right? Well, but that, he got tossed from cabinet for those ideas. Yeah, but... Okay, uh, <laughs> not me, um, but, but we, there's many of us across party lines who supported many but of Michael those ideas. Of we integrity. think the place could run a little better on how, um, even how real legislation get, gets passed. I, I think, you know, I think I said, part of the penance of being a constituency politician is I've got to go there and make legislation. At least try to make it a little less painful. Um, part of what was said earlier, the, the lack of orientation on how to do that properly or how to in, uh, assert yourself on amend, amending legislation or giving your voice on legislation le leads to, okay, somebody in a short pants saying, read this, mm. because you do not know that y you have a voice and you, can, and you can move forward. So Paul's idea of a greater orientation really hits home um, because it will allow parliamentarians to hit the ground running. It, it takes most one full session of parliament to figure out um, why are we still debating this? It seems we all agree. <laughs> right? if, if I can, uh, let me add just one, yeah. one thing that people may not realize is that in, in, the, you know, in the Liberal Party, there are three levels of caucuses that you go through with your own people. There was, the, for me, it was the GTA caucus would get yeah. together, then we would go to the Ontario caucus meeting, and then we would all go to the national caucus meeting. Yeah. The time that you get to have the microphone there and to make your case Pretty is, brief. is it's 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 available every week, every hmm. week. Oh, okay. So every, you're not complaining about it. I'm not no. complaining about it. It's, it. That's your forum to see whether or not your thoughts, your ideas, yeah. have a chance. Well, can I do a little? Sorry to do this. Let no, me go. do a little reality check with you here. Okay. You were a liberal member of parliament for a good long time. You couldn't be today you would not be allowed to run for the Liberal Party for a nomination today. Do you know why? No. To the best of my knowledge, Paul Zabo, on the abortion debate, you're pro-life. You can't be pro-life in today's Liberal Party of Canada. That's not true. It's not true? That's not true. I've certainly been told that anybody who does not adhere to the to the pro-choice position of the well, Liberal Party of Canada today can't be a member so of Parliament. So no Catholic can... No Catholic can run for the Liberal Party. Well, that not every Catholic is pro-life. Uh, well, I would say like, like uh, that never came up though. 
not in your day because it wasn't it wasn't oh, well, an issue sure then. was I was out there every year when the uh, pro-life March came to the hill every May and I was there and I represented my my views uh, as a liberal member of Parliament you were allowed to have them in those days you aren't today well uh, not being there but I could mm -hmm. say that you know to uh, uh, to deny people uh, on the basis of their religious beliefs uh, an opportunity to belong to the Liberal Party would be devastating to the Liberal Party, not to me. Okay, moving on here, let's do another quote from the Sabara Report. If you've ever had the misfortune of watching a debate over a piece of legislation, you know that it's one canned speech followed by another canned speech where Speaker B makes no attempt to address Speaker's a, Speaker A's point. They just read from a script with a different conclusion. Our parliament is show business for ugly people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who said that, but that's a form. You, you want to tell me who said that? No, I guess they're all anonymous interviews. Was it any better in your time? You, 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 you served more recently. Did you find that to be the case? Um, I mean, I think generally, we were talking about this earlier, like, for, you know, for the most part, people did show up with notes. And, and, you know, when I started, I would read from a script, but, you know, I, I wasn't really accustomed to public speaking and I learned eventually how to do it. So I do think we need to have um, the ability to have people who are, you know, not necessarily the most charismatic there, because that doesn't, charisma doesn't equate to your ability to do interesting work, to say interesting things. Um, and I think if we really want to open up uh, being a parliamentarian to a lot of different people, then just being able to give a nice speech without notes is not necessarily going to be your only test of that. <laughs> Although um, I think what we're, what, you know, that particular person and, 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 and a sense that we all have is that, you know, showing up not knowing what's in your notes and reading it line by line, mm -hmm. um, because this is not something that you've thought through and worked on, is something that is extremely concerning. And showing up, not listening to what else has been going on in the House, uh, what other questions have been asked, what the like issues have been on. Um, sometimes that idea that there's sort of this disconnect between speeches. So you've got one person comes in and says something, and then the next person doesn't address it at all or talks as though, you know, uh, it's tell like me, they're talking yeah. past each other rather than talking to each Jane, other. Tell, and I think tell, that's, us, uh, tell us how often you heard this complaint from MPs that you did exit interviews with? It was one of the most common, I think, in this last one, and it's why we called this report Flip the Script, because we were mm -hmm. challenging MPs to flip the script. Um, mm -hmm. It's, as I think uh, Mylin said, it's partly a symptom of time, um, that MPs don't have always a lot of time to go and prepare a 20-minute sort of speech or get up to speed on their file to speak off the cuff. Um, but it's kind of gone so far in the other direction that you've ended up with um, yeah, speeches that people haven't read before they stand up to read them. Let's find out. Did that ever happen to you, Joe? Certainly. Mm -hmm. and, and there was probably procedural reasons why it did. I, I, I'm, I do speak fairly well without notes and do think this is part of the best solution we could offer Parliament today is to take the paper out of people's hands. Could they really do that? Uh, we would find out it pretty quick, wouldn't we? <laughs> right. it, it, uh, there are many parliaments around the read. world where, where people will stand the point of order. He's reading, Speaker, uh, because you're not allowed to. Uh, government ministers can read legislation in, and other than that, it must be from your heart making a point on the bait. Mm -hmm. I think people would pay attention more. You, we've all been there where there's five people in the house and one person's rattling on about rail safety, and the rest of us are getting our homework done. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would mean people would pay attention. I think it would mean we would use a lot less time on debate. I think you could do a five-minute personal debate rather than 20-minute segments. I think we'd get through a lot more legislation if that was the case. But you asked the question. Certainly, there was times I, I walked into the lobby and they said, our next speaker isn't here yet. We go, need 20 on minutes this, on yeah. this because yeah. we, we can't close this today. So go kill the clock. Yeah. Read this, go right. kill the clock. And, and I would, you know, build in some personal things about Elgin Middlesex London in, <laughs> into the speech. Um, but for the most part, it was, it was done because that amount of debate needed to take place. Our, our regulations, our procedures say each debate must be of certain lengths. Can and, I understand and so we this have to get well, there. Let me understand this. Th there is a rule in the House prohibiting people from reading their questions? Correct. But every single <laughs> MP does it. No, that's not true. No, I don't okay. not true. I'm exaggerating. There, 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 there are, there are people does. who have them there, but I can tell you that uh, it's discouraged uh, because it doesn't look good. You don't know what you're talking about. If you want to impress somebody, you better come up with new information or build on what's already there. But keep in mind as well that you have a, a government member starts off the debate, and the second speaker is not another government member. It's, it's an opposition member. Mm -hmm. And so that in your, your document, it says, well, the second, second speaker didn't 
respond to that? Well, he, that person, and he or she, wasn't there to respond to, respond to somebody else's speech that they've never heard. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. it is to give the speech and their views and their party's views on what's on the table. But there so, are questions on each speech. There's five oh, minutes of yes. questions following. Oh yeah, each there's speech. dialogue that goes on in addition to that. But you can't just say one speech was a canned speech and here's another canned speech, another canned speech. Uh, that's embarrassing to a government if, mm-hmm. when their turn comes up three speakers later, and they have somebody who comes up and reads the same speech. Right. <laughs> that's not to say it has not happened. <laughs> and it happens. Sure. But they shouldn't. It's repetition. You, that's another mm-hmm. rule. I agree. Repetition. But- is not permitted. But right. there's one other thing that I think yeah. is happening here too, which is a, as you I think mentioned at the very start, Milan, like uh, message discipline is really important right. these days. Yeah. So like using the same uh, kind of framing yeah. on issues, yeah, right. and that right. happens, yeah. and, uh, and members are sort of told like, please hit this point, this point, this point, mm-hmm. and so you see sort of it's not repetition. Yes. Quoting, but it's repetition but in some sort of frame. Is is quite brief. And right. you can't give a speech on a, on a bill if, <laughs> if the, somebody's already mentioned the three points that's in the bill. Okay, so, yeah. But for the opposition, yeah. too, I mean, time is one of the only tools that they have, right, in order to um, try and get things out on the agenda, to try and control when things are going to be happening and things like that. So that's part of the reason that, like, especially um, in the 44th Parliament, and I think still today, we would we were often playing that game of having set notes ready so that someone could go out there because we wanted that 20 minutes because if we got to... All the time. Yeah, if we mm-hmm. got after X uh, time in the day, then we would move on to a different thing. We would skip this other thing altogether and mm-hmm. that would move to a few weeks from now and, and that was the game that we were playing. Sure. Um, time well, allocation. Yeah. Another Is that, thing that well, came or, up. Yeah. Or even procedural allocation. Yeah. I mean, oh. we must debate this for so many hours before yeah. it can go on to second yeah. reading or on to committee. At 5 o'clock, hmm. it's this bill, and if we right. miss 5 o'clock, we then today, we move to the next we're thing. we're going to go on. Okay. We're not going to have that bill again. How often do all of you, during your parliamentary careers, ask yourself, boy, this is a funny way to run a railroad. I, I, I did it in, <laughs> in the first weeks. I, I, I sat beside a very knowledgeable uh, man named Ken Epp, and I remember sitting there saying, Ken, I, I have to ask you a question. We all seem to be agreeing. Every debate, everybody's getting up and saying the same thing on this piece of legislation. Why are we not, why is it not coming to an end? I I didn't understand. (laughs) This is part of lack of orientation. He said, you know what, because we can't afford to get it wrong. We are making the laws of Canada here, and, and someone may say something that no one else thought of. And so I took that verbatim, and I take it to, to this day, and through my time in procedures, I took it, it, we better hear it, even if it does get redundant, even if it is boring, because it might yet be something that is amendable or we find something in a piece of legislation. Yep. But when you think about how your time is used in your political careers, yep. how, I mean, truthfully, how often... How often would something, oh, I hadn't considered that before, I haven't heard that before. Does it not only have to happen once for it to be worthwhile? I don't know, does it? I, I, I say yes. I think that, look, I, I already mentioned we can shorten the amount of time we do speak, which would allow more legislation to come forward. I think that would work. Far too many times we're running out a clock or, or an imaginary clock with longer speeches and longer questions. And, and I think we could accomplish what I just mentioned by making it shorter. Um, but allowing more people to speak for a shorter and period of time. Mm-hmm. The, the other part is that this is going to committee, and at committee you have witnesses, right. and they're going to help us ad- right. identify areas which we have not considered. Since right. you brought up committee, let me ask you about that, because there, uh, I do remember a time when committees were more collegial, when committees met and people heard other members' points of views, and they actually thought, okay, that's an amendment I can, I can agree with, and, and legislation through that process got improved. Yes. I'm not sure it's like that anymore. You guys can help me with this, but I don't know. Milan, in your experience, was it a... You, from what I've heard, it's a lot more today. Here's the ground that we are going to defend. We are absolutely not going to have any amendments to this bill. This is very much on brand for us. Get in there and do what you have to do to make... I mean, is that the way it is today? It, it depended on the committee. The, um, I sat on a few. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did sort of a few different... Um, you know, so... Uh, Procedure had its own way of doing things, Um, but certainly in my experience, um, you know, there were committees where the parliamentary secretary was, um, you know, her her staff or his staff um, was on the phone with the minister's office, and this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to do it, and it was very frustrating, and we'd all move in the camera, and then, you know, I can't tell you about 
why it is that we can't do this. Um, so it, it was very frustrating to be to be constantly trying to to bring new issues forward. But if they didn't fall within the government sort of agenda or didn't, we're going to you know. Um, even if it was just something that was not um, on the government's uh, plans, like something that was outside of their purview, um, they didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want to look like they weren't doing something. Well, um, I don't know. I've heard, <laughs> I, Jay and I kept hearing, like, our, our, you'd hear government members say, our job is to win this vote come hell or high water. We don't care about any other amendments. We just need to win. We need to win every little battle along the way. Did you hear that? We did. I take uh, Milan's point, it depended on the committee. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing we heard was that if you had a strong committee chair, it helped a lot in mm -hmm. terms of sort of maintaining that sense of collegiality and um, cross-partisan exchange. But some committees kind of broke down and became quite dysfunctional. And it was largely on those partisan lines, a sense that um, you couldn't even allow the opposition to amend the punctuation of a bill for mm -hmm. giving them, quote, a win, uh, which was, you know, not, not, I think, the spirit of what we want in our commons. What's your experience on that, Well, Joe? my experience is both sides. I, I was the long-serving chair of Procedure and House Affairs, and I think very collegial and got a lot of stuff done through minority and majority parliament. Elements. But let remind you of me, remi me remind you of the day that I was forced to take the chair because the opposition of the day voted out the chair that was in it yep. and elected me over my, my me saying no I don't want the job. <laughs> who, was the who was the chair that got? Terry Goodyear was was chair of, yeah. of Procedure and House Affairs during minority government and and the opposition of course ganged up at one point and said we don't want him as the chair voted non-confidence in him and we're electing joe preston that was what was more fun about a minority parliament <laughs> well, okay but, <laughs> but i'm saying collegialism can still mm -hmm. grow from that i um i eventually did accept the chair and and and, and stayed in it for seven and a half years and and, and put through some very good legislation and made some yeah. very good friends it, it, it is a bit of personality i mean that that is truly it it is you I, do I, get to be I, a team i must admit i've i've seen uh, parties uh, after they've sort of had a, dug their feet in, you know, right. ultimately make some changes because they've looked into them and they've decided that, yeah. hey, maybe we've got to educate ourselves a little bit more. I mean, we can't, parties can't know everything. Right. And we rely on witnesses, but also the expertise of people in the other parties as well. Some Agreed. of them have direct experience. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't think about it, keep in mind that people who draft the legislation aren't necessarily us. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. No, they're unelected people right. who are sort of, they're, so, well, we won't get into that, but, I mean, I should, ne you should never say that we can never have a change to a government piece of legislation or motion or whatever until you hear whether there are any arguments to the contrary. Well, let me follow up on that. I, I think, as most people know, governments champion legislation, a minister proposes it, and then, you know, through the right. process it goes. But every now and then, a so-called private member's bill, something sure. not championed by a cabinet minister, but by a government backbencher or, God forbid, an opposition member, right. uh, is passed and gets through. Yes. Any of you experienced that? Yes. Passing private member's bills? Certainly. Certainly. Uh, you all, all private member's bills were vetted at our committee before Health they came forward. Health warning labels by Julie, Judy in the NDP. Washa Lee Shalise. Washa Lee Shalise. Health warning labels on the containers of alcohol and yeah. beverages. Yeah. Right. Okay. There was a number of them, I mean, and, and there's some other ones that stand out that kind of got part way. My, I said Michael Chung's um, Democratic Reform Bill um, w had all uh, support from all sides. Uh, Lyme disease, uh, you know, as simple as that from from Elizabeth May. Look, look it, 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 you are right. There is some. I will hold this ground, regardless of what it is. I will not amend this bill because it's ours. I think there needs to be a better amendment formula, certainly at committees, than there is. I mm. may not be able to suggest it to you now as to how that might happen, but I think that's one of the other pieces that I think will remove some of the frustration. Of Legislation the, just being hammered through. Right. Jane, of the 50-plus MPs that you interviewed, how many of them expressed uh, some frustration at the fact that everything seemed to have to go through a minister's office and that they, they felt they were elected to, to go past laws as well, but never could get to first base on that kind of thing. I know. One um, cabinet minister we spoke to said if most MPs knew how cabinet worked, they might stop trying so hard. Hmm. Uh, sort of an honest take around, like, there's a, a whole system happening kind of un, un, out of sight of most um, MPs, especially, I think, those new MPs, if you're not uh, in cabinet. And I... I think for us, that's why one of our... Caucus still gets to see it. True, yeah. true. But it is, I think, really important. One change that could happen is that we try to develop alternative career paths for MPs in Parliament so that um, getting into Cabinet isn't the... 
be all and end all of, of the, the game. The opposition tries that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of whether you're opposite, when you're opposition, you're trying alternative career paths for the other guy. Uh, but okay. by strengthening committee, you can have no, I, a great I, I agree career with you. I'm as being a chair. Facetious, but yeah. I, I agree with you. There's um, there, there is a need still to be, for us to be able to share good ideas. And that's mm -hmm. all we're talking about with amendments, is to share good ideas. There's still a vote. It still can be turned down. But we've got to find a better way to do it. Let's just, in our last couple of minutes here, read this last uh, excerpt from your report. Without change, future exit interviews may find that MPs experience their own variation of something like Stockholm Syndrome as they become resigned to or even content with a system that simultaneously undermines them and their responsibilities as representatives. Did you hear any good ideas for turning the corner on this? Yes, we did. And I think this goes, I just want to say, like, um, these problems aren't just a symptom of the 41st Parliament. They're sort of bigger things that have been building over t in the past and I think are continuing into this Parliament. So um, why we need to get it right is, is this isn't just about what the former MPs had to say. It's very mm -hmm. much about the future. Um, our, our suggestions, as I was just sort of alluding to, focus on, I think, committees making them making sure that they're as strong and working as, as well as they can because they really are the workhorses of parliament they can give members a, a really important outlet to have policy and legislative yeah, impact yeah. um that and it requires the kids in short pants to just sort of back off a bit though, you're right it? it does yeah. and i think actually in this way we can look across to the uk in 2009 they made some really significant changes including electing committee chairs on the Great. basis of the whole of the commons so that um, chairs would be Lot beholden not to their party leader or the whips, but to yeah. the whole of the legislature and members across the aisle uh, for their support. Um, I think Joe's ideas about you know making sure committees can amend legislation right. and and that that's seen as a, a gold standard perhaps of right. committees' success and not seen as a, a a thing that the government has messed up or had an oversight. Right. Instead, it's this is great committee work that's getting done. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one area that we should really focus on. Okay, we and can. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, good for oh, you. On I that moment it's... of consensus, let's run with it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on the program today. Paul Zabo, the uh, longtime former Liberal MP. Milan Freeman, the short-time uh, NDP MP. <laughs> it's still four and a half it's years. It's still four and a half years. Hey, <laughs> not, not taking anything well, away from you. What's she accomplished? <laughs> <laughs> That's Joe exactly. Preston on the other side of the table, the former Conservative MP, and Jane Hilderman from the Samara Center for Democracy. And, of course, uh, lots more about this on your website and ours as well. So we invite people to check it out. And thank you for coming in to TVO cool. tonight. <laughs> Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.